And uh, Psalm 78, uh, look at verse, there's so much in it. Um, Verse 6, we'll go to verse 6. That the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments, and might not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that set not their heart aright, and whose spirit was not steadfast with God. But the children of Ephraim, being armed and carrying bows, turned back in the day of battle. They kept not the covenant of God and refused to walk in His law and forgot His works and His wonders that He had showed them. Marvelous things did He in the sight of their fathers and in the land of Egypt and in the field of Zon. He divided the sea and caused the, uh, them to pass through, and He made the waters to stand as in heat. And in the daytime also He led them with a cloud and all, that, all the night with a light of fire. And He clave the rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink uh, as out of the great depths. He brought streams also out of the rock and caused waters to run down like rivers. And they sinned yet the more against, uh, yet more against him by provoking the Most High in the wilderness. Verse 18, And they tempted God in their heart by asking meat for their lust. Yea, they spake against God. They said, Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Behold, he smote the rock, and that the waters gushed out, and the streams overflowed. And can he give bread also? Can he provide flesh for his people? And therefore the Lord heard this and was wroth, and so a fire was kindled against Jacob, and anger also came up against Israel, because they believed not in God and trusted not in His salvation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank You for the opportunity it is to be in a Bible-believing church this morning. Lord, we're not out in the world, and Lord, we're just away from the, uh, the temperature and away from the, 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 the forecast with the rain, Lord. And I pray, God, You bless the ones that have showed up and the ones that are tuning in, Lord. I pray, God, they get a blessing and they'd get some... Uh, strengthening for their Christian life. Lord, help them to uh, remember that God can furnish a table in the wilderness. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this church, and we thank you for keeping them safe. And I pray, God, that you'd uh, lead them and guide them, Lord, through all truth and put me out of the way and fill me with your spirit that I may preach the things you ought me to say and help the devil not to twist the words that come out of my mouth. Lord, we pray and ask these things in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. Amen. So an intro, uh, a man named Jack was walking along a steep cliff one day, and when he accidentally got too close to the edge and fell, on the way down he grabbed a branch, which temporarily stopped his fall. He looked down and, and to his horror saw that the canyon fell straight down for more than a thousand feet. He couldn't hang on to the branch forever, and there was no way for him to climb up the steep wall of the cliff. So Jack began yelling for help, hoping that somebody passing by would hear him and lower a rope or something. Uh, is any, help, help, is anyone up there? He yelled for hours, but no one heard him. And he was about to give up when he heard a voice. Jack, Jack, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. I'm down here. I can see you, Jack. Are you all right? Yeah, but who are you and where are you? I am the Lord, Jack. I'm everywhere. The Lord? You mean God? That's me. God, please help me, I promise. If you'll get me down from here, I'll stop sinning. I'll be a really good person. I'll serve you for the rest of my life. Easy on the promises, Jack. Let's just get you down from there, and then we can talk. Now, here's what I want you to do. Listen carefully, Jack. I'll do anything you say, Lord. Just tell me what to do. Okay, let go of the branch. What? I said to let go of the branch, and just trust me and let go. There was a long, uh, long silence, and finally Jack... Help, help, is anyone else up there? And that's just like us today and just like Israel that they get through God's help and they see through God helping them and, and aiding them and giving them everything they want and they want something else. Uh, you know, it sounds like us. And we want to say we want to serve the Lord and know His will and then when He tells us what He wants us to do, we often balk at what the Lord is doing. This was Israel's problem. They were called out of Egypt to follow the Lord by faith. However, they seem, constantly, uh, seem to constantly doubt the power doubt the promises, and doubt the presence of God as they traveled. Their entire attitude of their hearts is summed up in a two-word question, can God, in verse 19. And I want to remind you that God can. Yeah, amen. I realize that we are a lot like Israel. We often ask the question, can God? Uh, and I'm going to like to tell you and show you through Scripture, not through my words, but through Scripture, that God can and He has and He always will. The God we serve is still the Lord of glory. He is still the King of kings and He's able to do all the things He's been able to do Forever. You may be asking today, can God, and I don't know where you're at, I don't know what you're going through, but 
Maybe you have asked that one question, but can God? But God can. Notice the great truth from the passage. Number one, the condition of the people. Uh, the condition of the people in verse, one, uh, in verse 20 is uh, uh, they were faithless. Behold, he smote the rock that the waters gushed out and streams overflowed. And can he give bread also? Can he provide flesh for his people? Uh, and you see, look at verse 41. Later down the verse, you can go through the whole thing. And uh, verse 41, yea, they turned their back. He turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One. Their, their, their faith was limiting. Show me in Scripture where your faith is limited. It's not supposed to be limited. Yeah. You have Jesus Christ who is everything and who has everything, and it's not supposed to be limited yeah. to whatever you feel like, is whatever you feel like it, it is. And so they were faithless. They, here was a people who called themselves by God's name, and here was a people who should have trusted the Lord without reservation. Uh, you see throughout all the beginning of the chapter, marvelous things he's done before them, and things he's set up to their fathers that the children should know, and when they grow up, they should know these things, and they, they forget it. And they're faithless. Their, their faith isn't what it ought to be. Look at verse uh, 57. It, said, uh, it says, But turned back and dealt unfaithfully like their fathers. They were turned aside like a deceitful bow. And you know, their, their faithless was, isn't that a lot like us? It's a lot like the people uh, of the Lord today. Instead of trusting God and living by faith, we worry and we fret. Yeah. But you know what? It doesn't have to be that way. You know, you are God's children, you're God's child, and you're saved, you're blood-bought. I understand all of that thing. You're probably the best of the best, but you, you still are in the same predicament they're in. Yes, sir. And you put yourself in this whole chapter, and you find things through the plagues. You get more description about the plagues in this chapter than you do in Exodus, and uh, you start to come. God's our trust. And he never fails us. He never lets it, lets it go. The Bible says in John 20, he's he talking to Thomas. He's saying in verse 27, then he said to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And so he gives them a command not to be faithless, and Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed, but blessed are they that have seen not, and yet have believed. And you know, we haven't seen Jesus Christ, but we can believe that he is, and he will always be. Yeah. Our faith should be a good example of that. And sadly, they were forgetful. I went through this morning, and I went through, and I don't really recommend it, but I went through my, this whole chapter because I wanted to see how many times they forgot something. And man, I can't help but to think that's just like us. In verse 6, they, the generation to come might know them. So he's giving you something not to forget. He's that you ought to understand it, and you better, you better live by it, and you better know it. But then in verse 7, not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. You know, you, you get... Five, four verses later in verse 11, and forgot his works. How do you forget something that just happened to you? God just did all these things. He's given you food, and he's given you grace, and he's given you constant. Every, every trial that comes about you, he fixed. But you forget. You forget that, and you forget uh, in verse, can God, and you'll start asking. Because of your forgetfulness, you'll start doubting God. You'll start asking him if he could do something. Verse 30, they were not estranged from their lust. How come they didn't forget that? They forgot God's grace and God's mercy and God's gifts, but they, how do they not forget their own lust? You don't forget your lusts. Your lusts actually come, up, come, come more important than God's grace does. Verse 35, and they remembered that God was their rock. Oh, then they remembered. But you know why they remembered? Because there comes chastisement. And they sinned the more in verse 32. For all this they sinned still and believed not. For his wondrous works, therefore their days did he consume in vanity, and their van and, and their years in trouble. And when he slew them, that they then they sought him, and they returned and inquired early after God. Then they remembered, and in verse thirty nine, for he remembered that they were but flesh, a wind that passeth away and cometh not again. You know that's just like me. I have a little daughter; she's four, and I I have to. I, sometimes you forget that she's a four year old. You know, me, I, I want to take her down. I want to tackle her. I want to pin her in a pretzel. And I want to tap her forehead. But then I just realize, oh, she's only four. That's just like God saying with Israel, they're their flesh. I can't do everything. I want to I wanna do something so bad, but then I remember their flesh. I can't. My power is so great that I can wipe them out so easy. So he has a little bit of mercy there. And they see that mercy. The scariest verses in verse 30, uh, in, in the Old Testament, I think, in ver is verse 41. And they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One. Man, that's the scariest verse. 
They remember not his hand nor the day when he delivered them from the enemy. How do you, how do you forget that, Christian? How do you forget when God delivered you from the enemy? How do you forget that? They were forgetful. Look at Isaiah chapter 40. I don't want you to forget it this morning. I don't want you to come across tomorrow when the car goes into the wall, Brother Gene, and you, go, you start asking, can God give me another car? You no. Know? Can God help me? <laughs> I wasn't going to go there. All right, look at Isaiah chapter 40, verse 21. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Hath it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, and that stretcheth out, uh, out the heavens as a curtain, and spreadeth them as a tent, and to dwell in. That bringeth the princes to nothing, that he, he maketh the judges of the earth as vanity. Yea, they shall be not be planted, yea, they shall not be sown. Yea, their stalks shall not take root in the earth, and he shall not also blow upon them, and they shall wither. And the whirlwind shall take them away as stubble. To whom when, uh, then will he liken me? Or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high, and behold, verse 26, Behold, who hath created these things, that bringeth out their host by number? He calleth them all by names, by the, great, by the greatness of his might. For that he is strong in the power, and not, no, not one faileth. Why sayest thou, O Jacob, and speakest, O Israel, My way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed upon uh, over from my God. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He gave the power to the faint and to them that have no might, he increased his strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up as wings as eagles and they shall run and not be weary and they shall walk and not faint. Remember that. Don't forget that. With everything in your power, don't forget how great God is. Yeah. And you start limiting how, how, how awesome He is. Yeah. They were forgetful. The nation of Israel seemed to be unable to remember all the great miracles that God had performed on their behalf. How He had delivered them from Egypt by the plagues. And how He had parted the Red Sea. And how He made the waters of Mara sweet. How He had put the enemies on the run. And how He had proven Himself to be God and to be all-powerful. Time and time again, they were forgetful of the mighty power of God and they had witnessed in their life. Again, this describes us. It describes you and me and it, it doesn't. It. How many times has God come through for you? How many times has he moved mountains? How many times has he parted the waters of your life? How many times has he lifted the veil of affliction and suffering in your life and allowed the light of his glory to brighten the day for you? How many times has he spoken peace to your storm? He's met your need, done the impossible and proven himself to be God for you. How many times have we forgotten all of what he did yesterday when the trial of today pops up? We need to take a, look, take a look back and remember all the things God has done for you and me. And if God did it then, we can be sure he will do it now. We need to take inventory and remember the Lord's power when the next storm begins to blow in our life. They were faithless. They were forgetful. They were foolish. Verse 19. They were foolish. And I, and I, want, to say this, I want to say this correctly. Yea, they spake against God. They said, can God furnish a table in the wilderness, I don't know how foolish you can get. You read the scripture, how many times he's fed the 4,000, the 5,000, he's picked up scraps and done the impossible. How many times? And they were foolish. By asking can God, they proved their ignorance of his power and of his person. This same scene was played out many times during the course of Israel's wilderness wanderings and after they arrived in Canaan. One time that comes to mind is when the 12 spies uh, were sent to Canaan. And while, they, while there, they encountered a race of people known as the Anak. And they, uh, they, were, uh, they were giants. When the 12 faithless spies saw the giants, they looked at them, and then they looked at themselves and compared themselves to grasshoppers in Numbers 13. And, they start, and they, this same foolishness has followed the church to this very day. We are guilty of the same foolish comparison. Some problem will arise in our life, and we'll stack up ourselves against it, and we'll say, we can't do this. We can't get out of this debt. We can't run from it. But you start asking, can God? Can God? And can God? These are God's, these are God's own people that he has chosen. And, they, and they're forgetting everything about it. And they're, they're choosing to just look away from it. Why? Because they're so focused on today. They're so focused on the problem that's in front of them yeah. that they forget how faithful he is. Yeah. Amen. Don't be foolish this morning. 
This was the condition of the people, and I'm afraid we often mirror the same kind of attitude in our lives. I want you to know that it doesn't, need, it doesn't have to be like that in our life. We can trust the Lord, and we can know that he will demonstrate his power in our life. One way we, we can know this is by having a better understanding of the character of God. So you see the character of God. You saw the condition. They were faithless. They were, they were forgetful, and they were foolish. But the character of God is, is, is something that never, never will fail. And that's number one is his promises. In verse 5 of 78, his promises never fail. Verse 5, the Bible says of Psalm 78, For he established a testimony in Jacob. Has he established a testimony in your life? I know he has in mine. And appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers, that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children. And they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of, the, of God, but keep His commandments. You know, you ought to keep the promises that He gives you. When I got saved, I didn't know about justification. I didn't know sanctification. I didn't know redemption. I didn't know baptism. I didn't know any of that. But, you know, it didn't matter. I got saved because I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Everything else gets added to that. And just like these Israels, they get so much more than they thought they were getting in on. You know, you see the price is right, and you, see, you just see one little thing back there, but you, you see a box, and the box is just empty. But you don't know if it's empty or not. They're opening, they're opening the box, or they open the wrong one, and there's nothing in it. It's not like that when you get saved. When you get saved, you get something else. Yeah. Take it from me as a foster kid and growing up in Antelope Valley where Brother Gorski's at. When you get saved, God will give you a family. God will give you a daughter. He'll give you a wife. He'll give Woo. you a job. He'll give you a career. He'll give you money in the bank and things yeah. you want to do and vacation you all, things you never even dream of. Yeah. Why? Because you trust Jesus Christ and his promises. Amen. The Bible says in Romans 4, the Bible says in verse 18, who against hope believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken. So shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God. Is that you? Through unbelief. Staggered at it. Didn't, 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 didn't change things. But he was strong in faith in giving glory to God. And being fully persuaded that, that what he had promised, that he is able also to perform. The Bible says in Hebrews 6, 17, wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of the promise of the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might not have a strong consolation, who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon their hope, the hope set before us. Numbers 23, 19, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, shall he not do it? Hath he spoken, and it shall not make it Good. Titus 1, 2, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began, but hath in due time manifested his word through preaching, which committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. Stagger not at the promises. Yes. The character of God is his promise never fails. He says he's going to do it, he's going to do it. Yes. And it doesn't matter what comes about. Why? Because he always is and always will be the best on the earth Amen. and on out of the earth. Notice also his performance. Look at verse 4 of 78. His performance. He will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he had done. Look at verse, jump down to verse 12. Marvelous things did he in the sight of their fathers and in the land of Egypt and the field of Zon. And then he starts listing them. In the next three verses, four verses, I highlight them all in green because that's the Lord's color. And that's great things he's done. His performance, his, his performance throughout their history, Israel had enjoyed the presence and the power of Almighty God. Time and, time and again, God had demonstrated his power in the midst of his people. Imagine seeing him part the Red Sea. Imagine him drop manna from the ground or from the, from the, from the heaven. Imagine uh, every, manna every day for 40 years. Imagine seeing God defeat all your enemies. Imagine the thrill of seeing his glory as he came down upon the tabernacle. Imagine the pillar of cloud and of fire. God had proven himself time and again to his people. The Lord has not changed in this area either. He's proven into you. He's come down through for you. The more, he, we call him the last second God. Man, because he, he always comes in the last second. Why? Because right when you don't think you have enough, and it's it, and you're wrapped, it's, it's over, he comes in and says, hey, I'm right here. I haven't moved. 
Lord has not changed. Uh, he is still coming through for his people. Look back over the years and remember the times the Lord has displayed that as great powers in your life. Hasn't he parted the waters for you? Has he opened the heavens and, and, uh, of his great power in your life? Uh, has he opened the heavens and dropped manna of his glory in, on your life over and over? Hasn't he moved in response to your cries of faith? Ha, he has proven himself to you and, more, and, and, and me repeatedly. And notice also his power. His promises, his performance, and his power. Verse 4, we will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation in praise of the Lord and his strength. And his wonderful works that he hath done. His performance, man, that's the best thing out there. Yeah. No, no Maserati can beat the performance. No, sir. No, no, no wax eloquent scholar can beat that. No. Well, I can't read it because of these and nows. Well, this is you're an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> it's because you're an idiot. A little dumb foster kid can read this thing, and you can't? Uh, yeah. His power. Throughout their history, God has proven that he is stronger than every obstacle they faced. He was more powerful than Egypt. He's more powerful than the Amalekites. He proved himself to be greater than their thirst and their hunger. He was able to overcome all that they faced by his great power. You know of that power. You've tasted of that power, but you forget the power. He's better than the Energizer Bunny. He just keeps going, man. But you know, God is still all-powerful. The omniscient power of God has not, nor shall it ever diminish. He is all-powerful, and he shall remain so until the end of the unending eternity. I just want to remind you that God possesses all power in heaven and in earth. The Bible says in Matthew 28, 18, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me and in heaven and in earth. For with God, Luke 1, For with God nothing shall be impossible. You want an Old Testament verse? Fine. Genesis 18, 14. Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee, and according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. God's own testimony of his power is that son. That's right there. No one else can do it. He says, fine. You want, you want to prove it? Fine. Sarah's going to have a son. You're, you're crazy. You, you've like created too many things. Your brain is going out, and it's not going to work. The Bible says in Jeremiah 32, 26, Then came the word of the Lord unto Jeremiah, saying, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Can I remind you that our God, whom we serve, is able? Amen. Ephesians 3.20, Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. That power is in you. Yes. How do you forget it? You have it. Yeah. I don't forget my wallet. Why? I have my wallet. <laughs> you, how do you forget power of God if you have it? You have it if you're saved. Yeah. Notice his patience. And God is such a patient God. And I, I can't get any better than patience, than his patience. Verse 38, But he... Being full of, of seven, uh, Psalm 78, verse 38, but he being full of compassion forgave their iniquity and destroyed them not. Yea, many a time, would you underline that in your Bible? Wow. Many a time turned he, turned he his anger away and did not stir up all his wrath. For he remembered that, that, that they were flesh, a wind that passeth away and cometh not again. How oft did they provoke him in the wilderness? I don't know how many times he does. And grieve him in the desert. Yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited the, the Holy One of Israel. They remembered not his hand nor the day when he delivered them from the enemy. How he had wrought his signs in Egypt and his, and his wonders in the field of Zon. And he turned their rivers in, into blood and their floods uh, that they could not drink. He set their diverse sort of flies and among them which devoured them and, and frogs which destroyed them. You go through that all the way down to verse 55, man, that's some scary stuff coming. He's patient. He turned it away. He, 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 could have, he could have very easily, you know, uh, enough is enough. Yeah. I remember in Mark chapter 8, the Bible says in Mark chapter 8, he's feeding that 4,000, and they forget bread after they left. The disciples forget bread. And they say, well, all these problems have happened because we forgot bread. Mm -hmm. And then I love the verse and later. He says, why do they seek after a sign? I'm right here. Why? Why do they look for something else when it's right in front of them? You're looking for the wrong thing if you're looking other than Jesus Christ. Yeah, good. Amen. That's good. His patience. Thank God we serve a patient God. Many a time he turned his anger from them. He was patient with them and led them all along in love and in grace. How many times has he demonstrated that to you and me? There have been many times when, he, when we have failed to walk in faith in the Lord, but instead of throwing us away and taking something else, he could take the rocks. He said, you don't want to cry out? Fine, the rocks will cry out. You don't want to serve? You don't want to do it? Fine. I'll get, I'll get my creation to do it. My favorite verse, man, that's such a, uh, when I start talking about the creation and things, and I love the verse where they said that the trees clap their hands. Yeah. 
Fine. You don't want to clap. You don't want to. You want to pray. Pray. Worship to me. Fine. The trees will clap. They'll. They'll give me glory, and you won't. Fine. So you know the challenge for today. Number three. The, you saw number one. The condition of the people. The character of their God, and the challenge for today. Look at Psalm seventy-eight, verse six. Seventy-eight, verse six through eight. That the generation to come might know them. Even the children which should be born, he should arise and declare them to their children. That they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandment. And, not, and might not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation. You know, our forefathers, our fathers today, father of today, father of modern society and all that crap, they're just as stupid as these. They're just as rebellious and stubborn. A generation that set not their heart aright and whose God's spirit was not steadfast with God. Don't be that way. You know, the challenge of today is that those simple things, just three verses, just simple. When later, when, if you keep this, if you keep those three verses, you won't get later on in verse 18 where they start questioning 19 and when they start questioning God. If they would have just kept their belief and kept their commandments and set their hope in God, they wouldn't be wandering, oh, I wonder if God can furnish a table in the wilderness. You won't ever forget it. You won't ever have to. When we look at Israel's history and the way God proved himself to them, then when we consider how he has proven himself in our life and when we look at his power and his ability, what are we going to do about it? These verses tell us and know in certain terms what the Lord expects from us in a relationship, relation to these truths. Can I challenge you this morning? Have, have confidence in God. Yeah. Have some trust in Him. He says not tr set their hope and trust in Jesus Christ. Trust Him. Do you trust Him? I hope you trust Him. Because He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. Amen. He'll never take you out. Oh, I once saved, always saved. Yep. Why? Yeah. Show, me, show me other. Show me other than that, that God said I won't use you anymore. You won't find it. Mark eleven twenty two 22, and Jesus said unto him, he have faith in God. A simple statement. A simple statement. You could say that to the agnostic. You could say it to the, to the atheist. You just have some faith in God. That's it. Psalm 62, verse 8, trust in him at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. John 14, 1, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. Fine, you want to you put a separation between me and God? Fine, you want to have a problem? If you believe in God, you believe in me. Your lost loved ones, your friends, your family, whatever, they don't, they don't believe like you believe, but you know what? They're going to see it through you. You don't believe in God? Fine, believe what he did for me. Wow. You're, a, you're a living example, Romans 12. You're a living example. You ought to be doing it. These verses, verses teach us that we are to trust him for all our needs in every situation. When the world brings its hands in despair and doubt and asks the question, can God? We who believe should take this lesson in Psalm 78 that Israel didn't, and we're blood-bought. These people were just Jews. He was just their people that he was, he was after. He purchased you. Why, aren't you. why aren't you speaking up? God can. When the world looks at a declining morality, escalating violence, economic trouble, decrease in the popularity of the church, increasing evil, and ask the question, can God? We must be ready with the answer that God can. And this has always been the way it was throughout the Bible, and it is still today. There's just a few things that people, uh, in my mind, that, that had in their mind that said, you know what, God can. Daniel in the lion's den. You know the simple story. Darius spends the night wondering if God can, and Daniel enjoys the Lord's peace and rest knowing that God can. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Nebuchadnezzar stood with a smirk on his face as he sent the three Hebrew boys and asked, can God? Those same boys came out of the furnace, shoutly loud, and can, God can. Hey. The widow of Zarephath, she stood watching as the prophet ate the last of the meal and wondered if God can. The three, year later, three years later, she, still, she was still eating while all around, all around her people starved. And when she finished her meal, she could whisper with all assurance of her soul that God can. The disciples on the ship, they were in the midst of a storm and thought that they were finished and their hearts were filled with this question, can God? But in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus came walking on the waves, displaying all power of the Godhead, reminding the disciples that God can. Just simple things. But you know what? You're going to forget about them. You're going to forget those simple Sunday school lessons, those simple uh, stories in the Bible. Man, I love them. I can't, I can't get enough of them. Call to mind, would you last, the challenge for today is to call to mind, call to mind his past works. Would you remember? Would you remember some things while you still can? Think of, all, think of the times he's delivered you and he's saved you and the times he's moved mountains in your life. 
Remember His power and all that He's done for you. Let His past works remind you that He is able, no matter what you face in life tomorrow, God is able and He will come through for you every time. Let the past be a reminder and learn to trust Him no matter what. I remember a day when I stood condemned to die under conviction of sin and lost without God. And all I know is that, my, that my heart was filled with the question, can God? But when I bowed at the feet of Jesus and placed my faith in Him for salvation, I stood up saying, God can, yeah. God can, and God will. Yeah. I remember a day that. A man took his first airplane ride, knowing that he had been somewhat apprehensive about it. His friends were eager to hear how it went. At the first opportunity, they asked him if he enjoyed the flight. Well comment to the man it wasn't as bad as I thought it might be but I'll tell you this I never did put all my weight down that's just like Christians you don't want to put your weight all your weight down on Jesus Christ you want to you want to sit on one cheek or one leg and you just want to say I'm in church but I'm not in the church I'm part of the church but I'm not with the church I I'm a pat uh, uh, I'm with pastor but I, he's not my pastor or he's I, I'm on my church is you too my church is sitting at home no get in a local Bible believing church pastor Kim has told you that Yes. But yet you still sit on your stupid phone. Lastly, carry out His commandments. Would you obey it? Genuine faith in the Lord always manifests itself in obedience to the Lord and His Word. Remember, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. When we get into His Word and allow it to lodge in our hearts, changing us, and then we will learn to trust Him more and more. I'll never forget it, man. I, I was a youth pastor for several years, but you know, being down in uh, Bayview with Steve Andrus, my dad... Uh, I'm not the youth pastor, but I, I, I kind of like the youth, so I kind of take them out. During the summer, we took them to, I took two boys in the, the younger, younger group. I took them to uh, the batting cages, and we're sitting in the back of the truck, and there's one kid in the back, and there's one kid in the front seat, and the, the one kid in the front seat's a faithful kid. He's, he's been saved at five. I mean, the kid's in his Bible. I mean, he's, he's a solid kid. And the guy in the, in the, the kid in the back is kind of just, you know, he, he would love to come to church, but his parents don't come out that often. One of those types of things. Good, both really good kids. And uh, they were talking back and forth as I'm driving, and they're talking back and forth. And one of the kids asks, uh, are you reading your Bible? And he goes, no, I'm just not retaining it. I don't, I don't understand it. I don't retain it. And, and the kid chirped up, and he said, uh, well, then if you're not going to retain it, don't read it. I said, that doesn't make any sense. You know, kids, they, they don't know any better. I said, that don't make any sense. And he's like, what do you mean? I says, well, why do you take a shower? You're just going to get dirty again. I take a shower. You're just going to get dirty again. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I never thought of that. I said, well, you start thinking, well, why am I supposed to read my Bible? Why do I read the Bible? I'm not going to retain it. But you don't know what it's doing on the inside. Yeah. When you slam your finger, you used to say a cuss word, and now you're saying not. Now you're not. Where, where did that come from? That's yeah, not me. Preaching, you're, it's cleaning the inside out, and then now you're able to, now the things you weren't doing before, you're not doing anymore. Yeah. But it's, you ought to be reading the Bible just because, just because you, you're commanded to, and you ought to be doing it because of what it's doing inside of you that you don't see that someone else sees. It's, it's, more of a, it's more of a personal growth, sure, but understandable. But understand this, you may not retain it now, but when you start wanting to say a cuss word, you'll remember the Proverbs that you read about all watching your tongue and guarding it. You'll, you'll, say, you'll, you'll see a red flag when Joel Osteen says, today, every day is a Friday, wait a minute. You'll see the red flags automatically when they're not speaking truth. Call to mind those passwords. Would you remember? Carry out His commandments. Obey. Genuine faith is that. By hearing. You know, we lodge in our hearts, changes us, and we learn to trust Him more and more. You know, you ought to, you ought to, put, you ought to put your weight down when it comes to it. And I'll close with this illustration, but, you know, I, I took uh, my first airplane ride. I, t I had that illustration in there because of that put your weight down thing. But then I started thinking about my first airplane ride. In my first airplane ride, I was 12 years old, and I jumped in a airplane from LAX and I was going to West Virginia and there was a layover in, uh, in Houston and so I, I wrote it all out because when you get up here your mind is my mind doesn't really speak with it I start to ramble but I'll, I'll read it this it says uh, uh, so uh, once I flew from Houston Texas to West to Charleston West Virginia as I walked from the airport uh, building to the jet I was subject to the law of gravity when I came to the steps leading up to the plane's entrance I climbed and uh, climbed up the steps using my power to raise my body each step. On entering the plane, I sat in a comfortable seat and just relaxed. When all was ready, I had the jet taxied to the runway and after a while began to move down the long stretch ahead and the speed increased second by second until when it was moving about 150 miles an hour. I don't know, but it, it, was, it was booking then. 
It left the earth and rose up into the sky. The force of gravity against which I had climbed into the plane was still seeking to pull the plane down to the earth, the whole 150 tons of it. But there was another law in operation now against that law of gravity, and the new law, the law of aerodynamics. I knew nothing, nothing of the law of aerodynamics. I did not need to, because I was committed to the plane. And because I was relaxing, I rose in triumph with the plane. The triumph of the jet was my triumph. Its fantastic speed was my speed. All its possibilities were mine because I was inside of the plane. Thus it is with the law of, spirit, of, uh, of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. I did not understand the theology to benefit. All I need to do is commit myself spiritually to Jesus Christ. Yeah. I did physically to the jet. And notice that it wasn't the quality of my faith that took me to West Virginia. Notice that it didn't take any prodding or any, uh, any uh, uh, I am as strong as my faith in which I put my faith. If my faith is resting in Christ, then I am strong as he is. Notice too that it did not help, I did not help the plane, I didn't have to help the plane fly to West Virginia. It did not require any urging or pushing from me. The power was in the plane. Similarly, Jesus, can try, Jesus Christ can triumph in my life without help from me. There are many who fail to trust the Lord and fail to remember that God can. As a result, they live their lives defeated and discouraged. And it doesn't have to be that way. I, don't, I, I can get up, you know, I can cut the doctrine thing. I graduated Pensacola Bible Institute, whatever that is. But, you know, I, I graduated it barely by the skin of my teeth, as Brother Donovan says. You know, I can cut the doctrine, but I don't need to. I don't have to know the, the, the second advent and the tribulation and all that stuff to win a soul. That's right. That's true. I don't know all that stuff. It's all above my head. Well, so what? Yeah. Let it be above your head. Yeah. <laughs> when, it, when it's not above your head, you have a problem. Mm. Even, to, even today, you, you'll, ask, you'll ask Brother Donovan about a certain thing, or my dad or Brother Cam, you'll ask something, he's like, I don't know. Yeah. That's right. What do you mean? You're, yeah. you're like the pastor of all pastors, man. How do you not know this stuff? I don't know. And, it, and it's all right. That's, that's a good way to be. You know, but don't let Psalm 78 come about you. And I don't know if God can. I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if he could do this. I don't know if I'm going to make the end of the month. I don't know any of that. Well, God is faithful. That's good. And don't forget it. So God's people, don't forget that God can. Wow. Amen. Amen.